So my name is Gaz Drinkwater. Uh, I'm a presenter on BBC Radio Manchester and I am the Manchester United reporter for BBC Radio Manchester as well. And how has the season gone for you, Gaz? Going to all the different games, looking at the performance and holding your head <laughs> as a comment. Uh, season for me, season for me personally or season for Man United because they're very two very different answers. <laughs> for Man United then, how have you found uh, it? For Man, oh, for, for Man United, they've been absolutely useless. Um, it's been the worst ever Premier League season, technically, finishing eighth. Um, they've been ravaged by injuries. Um, there's been a few players who have performed in the past that didn't perform this season, the, you know, the likes of Casemiro, the likes of Marcus Rashford. Um, but I do think it has been a bit of a... I, I don't want to say an anomaly, because United haven't been good enough in games, but we've had so many different defensive partnerships Throughout the season, Rafael Varane has been out majority of the season. Lisandro Martinez has been out majority of the season. Um, Luke Shaw has been out majority of the season. They're three of, of our mainstay in defence. And I'd also say three of, three of our best players, in particular Martinez and Shaw, who I think are some of the best in their position in the league, actually. Um, so having them out has, has, has massively curtailed United's expectations. Um, and then, you know, there's a few other players that have, have been brought into the club, which are still bedding in the likes of, you know, Rasmus Hoyland. I mean, he's on 16 goals for the season, which really isn't bad for a 21 year old just coming to the Premier League. Um, uh, 16 goals in all competitions, that is. Um, however, it, it, United sort of rely on him because we don't have anyone else. And. A lot of the reason of that is because of the poor football structure at Manchester United. So I suppose one of the real positives this season is it looks like that footballing structure is changing behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, another positive is, is a lot of the young players coming through. The likes of Kobe Mainu, Hoyland, who I mentioned, um, Alejandro Garnacho as well. Like These are all really, really talented young players that I, I, I think will be very important for United in the future. I'm thinking then about the future, thinking to the near future of Sunday and your mention of the defence against one of the most dominant scoring teams in the league. What's your feeling about Sunday's final? Um, I'll be honest, I don't really have a lot of hope for Manchester United in this game. Um, I, I, I just feel like, you know, we, I mentioned the injuries. These players are coming back. Like Martinez started the last game of the season, the first game he started since February. And even that, he was only in the, the team for a short while before he got injured again. Um, Martinez is, is coming back. Um, Varane also came on off the bench against Brighton. You'd think he would be fit. Luke Shaw's very, very doubtful, even though he has been included in the Euro squad. I don't, I don't even think he'll make the Euros, to be honest. Um uh, and 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 you're coming up against the Manchester City team, which you know, a, a, in many ways, a winning machine. Um, they're a very, very, very good team, probably the best in the world. I don't really mind saying in terms of quality, in terms of manager. Um, the, the only real saving grace is that it is a cup final, and weird things happen in cup finals. Weird things happen in derbies. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm well. not. Yeah, exactly, and yeah, the FA Cup. I mean, we we saw it with United this season. People obviously point out the Coventry game and what happened there, but even thinking back to Newport County where United were cruising in that game and let a mid-table League Two team back into it. So, um, yeah, the only saving grace really is that there is that magic of the cup. Um, maybe that could happen, but, you know, I, I very much doubt it. One thing I will say is I don't think this is going to be an absolute demolition. Um, City do have it in them to put four, five, six, Oh no! I, I I think we will. I think City will win, but I think we may be talking a two-one, a three-one, something like that. Yeah, and then thinking then about the competition that you've had: Wigan, Newport, you mentioned Forest, Liverpool, and Coventry. What do you reckon has been the toughest game? Because on paper you'd probably say Liverpool, but watching the game and commentating on it, such as yourself, you might say different. No, that's a, that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, I, I weirdly think the Liverpool game is probably the one we played the best in. Um, United really took them toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It wasn't a case of United hanging on and getting that goal at the end through lucky means. United really, really took them on, and Old Trafford was rocking like I've never experienced 
ever in my life, I don't think, that day. And I've seen United in Champions League semi-finals and, and finals and obviously not Old Trafford in finals, but um, I've seen some incredible atmospheres. Um, United made it difficult against pretty much every other team that they played against. You know, Forest, it needed the goal right at the end. Um, Newport, as I've said, we let them back into it. Coventry, we let them back into it. Um, but the Liverpool game, I would probably say, is, is one of the best performances of the season. Um, and what, what a moment it was as well. I mean, the Coventry game, I understand that people talk about how they got back into it. But for 70 minutes, or maybe 65 minutes, I would have said that that was United's best performance of the season. United were so, so dominant. There was, there was, there was no way. We, we were talking in commentary about, you know, when do we bring the kids on? We're 3-0 up, we're cruising, one more goal or 10 more minutes, and you start bringing the, the under-18s on. Um, and how it capitulated is just mind-boggling. And do you feel like Sunday's final has a set structure to it, a fairy tale ending for Man City getting the double or Man United season almost being saved by getting silverware? Um, this isn't just coming from a Manchester United fan here. Um, I don't really think anything Manchester City do is a fairy tale, personally, with everything that's going on in the background at that club. Um, uh, but Manchester United, I mean, it, it would be a fairy tale in terms of if the young lads really turned up and and got themselves a cup against your local rivals. I mean, what a way to start your career, especially for Kobe Mainu. This is his first season in senior football. He's in the provisional Euro squad. I think Southgate would be silly not to take him because he has been phenomenal. Um, it'll be a fairy tale for guys like that. Um, it'll be a fairy tale for Eric Ten Hag as well. Um, for everything everyone has criticised him for, me included. Um, I've criticised him for the style of football we've seen this season and the chaotic way that Manchester United play. Um, but for Eric Ten Hag to have two seasons at Manchester United with a trophy, a one third place finish, and then another trophy. And then, yes, I know it was an eighth place finish in the end, but it would certainly set us up in good stead for next season, I think, with this change in structure in the background. I think before next season then, and looking forward to what the new season might bring in, thinking about BBC local radio and the fact that you've got people watching the game on TV, but also there'll be thousands of people listening to your voice on the commentary. How do you think radio keeps relevance with the likes of other media platforms? And why is it so important as well? I think in terms of, you know, I, I think radio is still the most personal medium there is. Um, and this that's obviously not just relevant to sports broadcasting. That's just relevant to broadcasting in general. Um, I, I still think radio is important for a lot of people particularly, I, I feel like the, the way that maybe people have listened to radio has slightly changed in the fact that a lot of the time people, when people listen to the radio, they're listening to it on their own, um, whether that be, you know, in the kitchen cooking tea, whether that be on the way to work, with it in the car. Um, a lot of people who are listening to the match, for example, at the weekend, probably will be on their own while they're listening to it. So, I think radio has that responsibility to remain personal and um, really feel like you are just talking to one person. Um, and yeah, for, for sports broadcasting, look, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that if you were if you were able to, most people would rather watch a game of football than listen to it on the radio. But that doesn't mean that there's not a place for it when people aren't able to sit in front of a TV screen for two hours. Um, and I also think in local radio, for example, when I do Manchester United commentaries, I mean, my commentary against Liverpool for the, the, the Ahmad Diallo goal, it, it got a lot of traction online because I, I think that people responded to it because they could hear my passion. They could hear that this is a Manchester United fan commentating on Manchester United winning in the last minute. Now, obviously, that's a game against Liverpool and I work in local radio for Manchester. That's easy for me. This weekend, it will be different. Um, in fact, the way that we do it at Radio Manchester is um, I will share commentary duties with our Manchester City commentator, Mike Mindy. Um, So I will do 22 and a half minutes 
he will step in and do 22 and a half minutes. And then in the second half, we'll do exactly the same thing. We'll obviously have both United and City pundits with us throughout the whole thing. But it's something where you should be able to hear the passion for Manchester uh, as well. So for the audience that it represents, I feel like it's a lot more relative to them. I was going to say the fact that you are a Manchester United fan, but also on BBC Radio Manchester, there's a load of other people listening to this that will be supporting the other side. How do you keep that partisan nature throughout your commentary? Um, like, like I say, the, 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 the partisanship is it's really easy when you are um, not commentating on a, of another team from Manchester. Um, because you can lose yourself and that's fine. It, it's what everyone else is doing when they're listening. When I'm screaming about Ahmad Diallo scoring the winner, people who are listening, they're screaming as well. You know, they, 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 it's, it, it's harbouring that emotion. Um, I was going to say without going a little bit too far, but I am known for going a little bit too far at times. Um, and, and that will be the same for this weekend. However, I won't just be thinking of Manchester United fans. I'll be thinking of Manchester City fans as well. Um, so if Manchester City score, I do have to put myself in that mindset of I'm picturing a Manchester City fan from Fallowfield um, listening to this game, you know, right now and he's screaming at his radio because he's celebrating. And that's who I've got in mind when I'm commentating on a Manchester City goal, because, you know, at the end of the day, that's 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 my job. Um, but obviously, I'd rather be commentating on a Manchester United goal. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Thinking about Manchester United players, Man City players, and also as a nation as well. This week, we've had the announcement of the England Euros team that you've alluded to earlier. But what are your thoughts on the team and moving forward to next month and also uh, July as well? The fact that Maynou is included, Rashford not. What's, what's your opinion on the provisional England squad? Uh, yeah, so... Some interesting ones in regards to Manchester United specifically. Um, I, I've sort of already alluded to Luke Shaw. I'm surprised he's even been included in the provisional squad. I cannot see him being fit for the Euros. It would be a massive surprise and also somewhat of a massive risk if he were to go to the competition. Um, so, yeah, Luke Shaw surprised me. Kobe Mainu didn't surprise me. It would surprise me if he's not in the list to actually go to the competition when it's actually shortened down, um, because I think he should be. And I also think he could be a really important midfielder for Gareth Southgate. Um, I, I think the way that a lot of England teams that I've seen on paper, they look fantastic on paper. You have Declan Rice, Jude Bellingham, um, Cole Palmer in front of them, Phil Foden on one wing, Saka on the other, Harry Kane up top. That sounds incredible, but Beckham, Lampard, Scholes and Joe Cole, that also sounded incredible. It didn't work tactically. And I almost think that this team that we're seeing that's going around, I'm not sure it would work tactically. I know that Jude Bellingham played as a number eight for Borussia Dortmund. I think it's different in international football in, in these competitions. I don't necessarily think that's his best role. I think he is a number 10 now. And I think Someone like Kobe Mainu, look, Jude Bellingham is a better player than Kobe Mainu. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying who is the perfect fit for that position. And I think Kobe Mainu is better than Phil Foden as a number eight. I think he's better than Jude Bellingham as a number eight. I think he's better than Declan Rice as a number eight. Um, and and, and I, I, think he, I think he could be a perfect fit for that position. I really, really do. Um, so my only worry is that Gareth Southgate, has maybe made the mistake that other England managers has made, have made in the past. And that's just, it sounds daft, but he's just put all of his best players in there, which sounds like the right thing to do. But yeah. sometimes you've just got to think whether they work together. Um, and that would be my only concern. One thing I will say is that a lot of people were worried about Gareth Southgate picking his favourites. Um, he's certainly not done that this time. Uh, Marcus Rashford's exclusion slightly surprised me because I thought Southgate would stick with his man, because I don't think Rashford has ever let England down. Um, and also Rashford's great at getting in behind, and I don't really think there's many players that will be playing in that front line who are that type of player. Um, but Rashford's performances this season don't warrant a place in the England team. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And just very briefly, do, do you have a feeling about 
how far England will get into the Euros? Uh, I will be honest. I've not sat down and looked at the potential journey that they would go through in the tournament. Like yeah. I've not looked at, you know, like like for, for example, the last tournament, we knew that it was likely they would play France in the quarterfinals. So last tournament, I was saying quarterfinals, but if we do beat France, we can go and win it. And we yeah. didn't beat France in the end, even though we really, really should have based on the performance. Um, so I, I'll have to have a look at it that way. I will say in terms of quality compared to the other teams, England are as good as anyone. They are, they, they, like on paper, that team, that team can beat anyone. Um, so, you know, we need a few things to go away, maybe get a bit of luck here and there. Um, but that England team on its day should be able to beat anyone. And thinking then about the teams and the players within them, with Man City, it's easy to say you've got good players in Foden, in Grealish, in Walker, when a team is working dynamically and they are good. But when a team isn't operating as good, such as Manchester United this season in comparison to other teams or other seasons, is it easier or harder to identify the really good players that have st- stood out throughout that season? That's an interesting question. I'd almost argue that it's easier mm. because, like, for example, you watch Manchester United and I'm always one of those people who I don't necessarily go off stats. Yeah. I, I go off watching the players. Um, and, and, you know, I suppose with City as well, Phil Foden has clearly been the best the, the best player in that City team, in my opinion. Rodri is maybe the one that it comes up against him. Two unbelievable footballers. Um, and, but for Manchester United, it's almost more obvious because Kobe Mainu, he's stuck out like a sore thumb at times. I, I keep talking about this guy, but he is the shining light of Manchester United at the moment. And it's a consistent performer. And, you know, it helps that he's usually got Casemiro alongside him, who has just been absolutely dreadful this season. Um, but Cobby Mainu, whenever the ball comes to him, it, it, his, his awareness, his first touch, his, the way he can turn on a ball and turn round a man, he's press resistant. He's, he is just a fabulous, fabulous footballer. Um, so I'd maybe argue it's a little bit easier in teams that aren't doing well to identify the good players. Um, but it's maybe easier to identify the great players in teams that are playing well. Because if you can stand out in a team that is winning the Premier League, like Phil Foden has, you're one of the best players in the world. Phil Foden is one of the best players in the world. He's, as much as I dislike watching Manchester City win games of football, he is a delight to watch. And I actually am looking forward to this summer watching him in an England shirt and being able to genuinely support him. I think that's nice, that factor of having a national team. Everyone, even if you don't even like football, you know a match is happening. The fact that that build-up is there is so, so obvious. The whole country getting together. But thinking about Sunday, what do you think the scoreline is going to be? Um, My head says 3-1 Manchester City. Uh, my heart says 6-0 Manchester United. <laughs> and then thinking then off of that, obviously you've got two different sides of a coin there. Is there such things as bragging rights in the city of Manchester? Yeah, of course there is. Um, I mean, it, it, it it's massive and it's become particularly bigger in the last 15 years um, or whenever it was that City, you know, got lucky with their takeover. Um, the, the, the bragging rights have obviously massively increased. I do think there's still a lot of frustration from... The, well, fr- firstly, there's a lot of frustration from Manchester City fans that I think that their success maybe hasn't been... hasn't been as accepted by a wider football audience as maybe Manchester United was once upon a time. Um, there are many reasons for that. There are 115 reasons for that. Um, however, you know, the, I, and I think the way that City would took over as well, I, I think that takes a lot of romance off what they have achieved. But that does not take anything away from the fact that Pep Guardiola is a genius. He's one of the greatest managers we've ever seen. And that Manchester City have had some of the most fabulous Premier League f- footballers that we've seen um, in the last 15 years. 
the reason that some of the romance that has been taken out of it is because of the structure that we've in place to actually get Manchester City to that position in the first place, which I do think to a lot of the wider footballing audience feels a little bit fake, maybe. But, you know, that, that's just me. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is just because it's a recent thing. Maybe in 20 years' time, no one will care about any of that and people will only remember the Kevin De Bruyne's, the Sergio Aguero's. I don't know how long Haaland will stay at Manchester City, but if he yeah. stays for another five years, it'll be Erling Haaland, Phil Foden, Bernardo Silva. Fantastic football, some of the best we've ever seen. And it's it's not their fault that the structure behind Manchester City, you know, is currently facing questions. I mean, away then from behind the scenes, thinking about recently, thinking about on the pitch, thinking about finals, the 2023 FA Cup final, exactly the same as the 2024 FA Cup final. Yeah. Do you reckon, uh, first, has Manchester United learned anything? And secondly, has Manchester City also learned anything from last year? Uh, hopefully Manchester United have learned not to go 13, to go longer than 13 seconds without conceding a goal. Because um, I'll be honest, when that happened last season, I just feared the worst. As soon as that went in, I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be a whitewash. Um, I don't think that'll be the case this year. Maybe we'll go 15 seconds this time. Um, it, I, I'll, cheer, I'll cheer if we win the kickoff at this point, honestly. Um, I actually think Manchester City have been worse this season than they were last season. They've still, I'm not, they still deserve to win the Premier League. They were brilliant. They were unlucky to go out of the Champions League as well. Uh, and that's a testament to how good they were last year. Um, because I don't think they've been as good this year. Um, and I do think they have it in them to have an off day. Um, we saw it in the semi-final against Chelsea. Chelsea were very unlucky in that game. Um, and for, for, for Manchester United, what have we learnt? It's difficult to say because we've not had the same team all season. Um, you know, you, you, you would hope, you would want to go into a game like this where even if you have had a lot of injuries, to have the likes of Martinez and Varane and players like this, you'd hope to have had them back a few weeks ago so they could play some games together and we could actually see how much this United team has developed. But it's so hard to predict. It really is. I, I don't know if Manchester United have learned an awful lot, but you know, one can only hope. 